Heavenly Father, thanks for this time. Lord, thank you that we have this wonderful opportunity to love you, to worship you. Lord, we pray that as we open up our Bibles, we could also open up our hearts. Lord, we pray that we would be open, teachable. Lord, we pray that we would allow our hearts to be informed by you, that we would evaluate everything in light of your character, in light of your love, in light of your promises. Heavenly Father, you've been faithful this past year. And Lord, we have every reason to believe that you're going to be faithful and that you are faithful today and tomorrow and for all our tomorrows. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 with a little fear, with a little trepidation. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Most Bible teachers and scholars unanimously agree that this particular passage in this particular chapter is one of the most difficult in the entire New Testament, but I'm going to also suggest to you that it's one of the most rewarding chapters. Remember what the writer has done as he has introduced to us the things that we've been learning in the book of Hebrews. The writers encouraging the reader to leave spiritual immaturity and to go forward in spiritual maturity. And the necessary exhortation to spiritual maturity is prompted by the fact that the Hebrew Christians were not growing spiritually. They had grown Dull in chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Remember, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you become dull of hearing. And since they weren't growing, the Hebrew Christians were in a kind of spiritual infancy. Most of us are familiar with J.M. Barry's book. It was entitled Peter and Wendy. Some of you must have seen some sort of incarnation of Peter Pan, whether it's on television or reading the book. You know the story. It's the story of a boy who could fly, and he lives in a place called... You guys know that. He lives in Neverland. And the reason why it's called Neverland, it's because it's the place where boys and girls go to, and they never, they never grow up. In this place of perpetual childhood, it's filled with all kinds of adventures. It's filled with all kinds of dangers. Barry, the author, mentions in Peter and Wendy that Peter Pan still had his first teeth. 
He describes him as a beautiful boy with a beautiful smile. And in the original book, it says he was clad in skeleton leaves and the juices that flow from trees, unquote. And of course, in the play, Peter's outfit is made of autumn leaves and cobwebs. And his name and the playing of the flute or pipes suggests this mythological character, Pan, who was the Greek god who lived in the forest. And according to the book, on occasion, real children could make their way into Neverland. And part of the point of the book is is the perils that surround those who want to remain in a kind of a perpetual childhood. And the Hebrews were in a kind of perpetual spiritual neverland. God had spoken through the Lord Jesus Christ. Both the Hebrew Christians had neglected God's word, found themselves drifting from God's word, departing from the word, and the writer was encouraging the spiritually immature to grow up. And he see, he seeks to do that by demonstrating, remember, that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Judaism. Jesus is superior in his person in chapters 1 through 6. He's going to be superior in his priesthood in chapters 7 through 10. He is superior in the sense that the principle of faith exceeds the principle of the law of Moses. And so the Hebrew Christians had a moral problem. They were behind in their duty in chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. But they also had a spiritual problem. They were arrested in their development. They were babes in need of milk, you'll remember. And so the chapter begins with an appeal in verses 1 through 3. The appeal is to go on to spiritual perfection. And when the Bible uses that term spiritual perfection, it doesn't mean being a perfect person. It means growing up. And the writer then expresses a concern in verses 2 and 3. And the concern centers around those who have an understanding about God and then turn from their understanding about God. And the writer then makes an argument that centers not on the subject of salvation, but on the subject of repentance. Why is this important? Because it determines the meaning. What is our attitude about God? What is our attitude about the word of God? So the the writer is going to illustrate that point, by the way, later on in the verse, in verses 7 and 8. And then he's going to provide assurances for the believer in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. And we're going to come to that. But beginning in verse 1, at the very beginning of the verse, look what it says. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ... Let us go on to perfection. He begins with an exhortation. Grow up. According to J. Vernon McGee, he says, quote, Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ is literally, quote, Leaving the word of the beginning concerning Christ, unquote. He uses the illustration of a builder leaving the foundation of the building in order to put up a scaffold. He uses the illustration of a child in school learning his or her ABCs. But guess what? Once you've learned the ABCs, you start to do other things. You read and you write. You go on and eventually you'll graduate from middle school and high school and and college, some of you, and graduate school. Going on to perfection is a description of a journey that's supposed to lead from spiritual immaturity to spiritual maturity. And so when it says, let us go on, 
that word or that expression means to be born or to be carried. And by born, I don't mean B-O-R-N like a baby is born. I mean carried in the sense that somebody picks you up and, and places you on their shoulders. It's sometimes translated pick up or upholding. The writer isn't suggesting some sort of self-effort, uh, but rather allowing the Spirit of God through the Word of God to carry you forward in your real relationship with God. We yield to God by allowing His Holy Spirit to come inside of us. We're carried by the awesome power of God who creates the universe and this same God who creates the universe has the ability to move you from the place of immaturity to maturity. Instead of going forward, again, these Hebrew Christians were going backwards. We've said this repeatedly. Many had already returned to Neverland. This is the land of perpetual adolescence. They were tempted to return to Judaism. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. Why? Why is this important? That's what it means when he says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principle, principles or foundations, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. I'm going to suggest to you just for a moment that the foundation that the writer is literally talking about is this foundation of the revelation that's been given in the Old Testament. You see Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it provides the foundation of the revelation of God, the communication of God, what God has said. And so the foundation in all likelihood means the revelation of everything that's spoken of in the Old Testament. Everything that prepared the way for Christ. Everything that opened up people's heads and minds and hearts to the reality. Not only concerning the human condition, but how you could be saved. And how you could be delivered and how God was going to send the Messiah. And so, the writer lists six truths foundational facts of the Old Testament which prefigure Christ in ritual, symbol, and ceremony. One of the things when I was preparing this, I noticed that there were a group of scholars who in talking about these things, some said, are these things as they relate to the Old Testament or are these things that relate to the New Testament? And it suddenly occurred to me that these are the things that relate to the Old Testament, ritual, symbol, and ceremony that prefigure the things that are going to be unveiled in the New Testament. So does the Old Testament contain ritual, symbol, and ceremony? The answer is yes. Does that ritual, symbol, and ceremony mean something? The answer is yes. It has to do with Jesus. Are New Testament believers discouraged from embracing ritual, symbol, or engaging in ceremony? My answer might surprise you. I don't think that the point of the passage is to discourage people from doing ritual symbol or ceremony, but rather of disconnecting from the ritual, the symbol, and the ceremony, its ultimate meaning, its ultimate purpose. Let me give you kind of an example. Imagine a person says, I don't believe in symbols or ceremony. And so they don't want to get married. They don't want to go through the hassle of a service. They don't want to wear a ring because they think that the ceremony or the symbol has no value whatsoever. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that sometimes ritual and sometimes symbol and sometimes ceremony has great value. But does the symbol, the ritual, and the ceremony have value apart from God, apart from Christ, apart from him really coming, apart from his real life, apart from his real ministry, apart from his real death and his real resurrection? The answer is no. 
In other words, imagine, do, imagine, imagine saying, maybe as a kid you even did it. Let's pretend we're getting married. And so you play pretend. And, and you say to the neighbor boy or the neighbor girl, hey, let's pretend we're getting married. And you have somebody else on the block. You get to be the groom and somebody else gets to be the bride. And, and you go through the thing. And then the person says, and I now pronounce you man and wife. Are you? No, because it's pretend. But in the real world, it's not pretend. Now imagine you go through the real ceremony of a marriage. And on your honeymoon, the first thing that you say to your husband or your wife is, hey, joke's on you. We're not really married. I didn't really mean it. It was one great, you see, the truth is I'm already married. How many people do you know that would be comfortable with that kind of news? Not very many. So here... When he's talking about this, I want you to understand he's talking about being able to go forward, not only in the revelations and the doctrines of grace. Now, let's look at it really quickly. Not laying, again, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of dead, and of eternal judgment. And so he's going to talk about six different things and we're going to look at them just very very briefly he's saying not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God the first thing is repentance from dead works the second thing is faith toward God the third thing is the doctrine of baptisms. The fourth thing is the laying on of hands. The fifth thing is the resurrection of the dead. The sixth thing is eternal judgment. What do all of these things have in common? These are biblical truths that are revealed in the Old Testament, fulfilled in Christ. So what is the author saying? Is he saying, well, these doctrines are unimportant and only for the immature? That's not what he's saying. These are vital and they are basic. But when he says repentance from dead works, I want you to mull that around in your mind for a moment. Repentance, you know what that word means. It means to change your mind from dead works what are the dead works that he's making reference to? I'm going to suggest to you that he's making a reference to the works of the Mosaic law. It's the changing of your mind that the works of the Mosaic law can save you. And by the way, that was Paul's belief, I think, as a rabbinic Jew, as a Pharisee. Remember, he was laboring under the idea that, hey, if I'm a good Jew and I'm reading my Bible and I'm, I'm doing what God asks me to do and I'm, I'm washing my hands and I'm, I'm giving alms to the poor and I'm going to the temple and I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. If I do everything that I'm supposed to do, will I have a right relationship with God? And you'll remember what happens to Paul on the way to Damascus. Jesus shows up. The living Lord of heaven shows up and he becomes completely and profoundly aware that the only way that you can have a right relationship with God is having a right relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to suggest to you that the Hebrews and then the Hebrew Christians were involved in this never-ending cycle to keep the law of Moses. So again, think about the cycle for just a moment. Let's keep the law. Uh-oh, we made a mistake. We broke the law. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep the law. Break the law. I'm sorry. I messed up. Keep the law. Break the law. I'm sorry. I messed up. Again, it, it becomes a type and a picture of the immature Christian who goes, 
oh, I want to be a good Christian. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do everything that's right and good and appropriate. Both Jews and Hebrew Christians and some Gentile Christians never met a law that they didn't break. Show me a law and I'll show you someone who breaks that law. And you've all experienced it. You see the sign. Don't step on the grass. Why does every molecule in your body want to step on that grass? Don't touch this wet paint. And you go, got to find out for myself. We, so there's this cycle. Now, I want you to think about it. Just like immature Christians trying to keep the law, failing again, what the writer is basically saying is, this is all baby stuff. Faith toward God. In the Old Testament, did it teach you to have faith in the Lord? Trust in the Lord. Yeah. Now, again, I want you to think about it. James said, you say that you believe in God. Well, demons believe in God. And they tremble. Does simple belief in God save you? The answer is no. If that were true, then demons would get to be saved. For some to simply believe in God, they think that they've taken a long journey, and perhaps for some, that's exactly what they've done. They go, well, you know, I used to wonder whether or not there was God, then I didn't believe that there was a God, and then I thought for a long, long time, maybe there's a God, and now I've come to the conclusion that there's probably a God. Well, good for you. You've come a little way, but you haven't come very far. And just because you've come a little way doesn't mean that you should stay in that place. And then the doctrines of baptisms. The baptisms here probably don't refer to the New Testament rite of baptism or Christ's command to baptize the disciples. I'm going to suggest to you that it probably means the Old Testament washings, the ritual cleansings that are talked about in the Levitical washings. The Hebrew Christians were tempted to return to these external rites of cleansing when in fact the Lord Jesus and his blood cleanses us from all sin. In Mark chapter 7 verses 4 and 5 there's that particular story where the religious leaders go to Jesus and they say... It says, when they came from the marketplace, um, they do not eat unless they wash. There, there are many things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, the washing of pitchers, copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribe asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands, unquote? In other words, the ritual washings that the Jews engaged in isn't like when you wash, where you go, well, it makes sense to wash. You know, I've always been taught to wash my hands before dinner. Well, do you wash your hands so that you'll have clean hands with clean food so that you won't get sick? Or do you wash your hands because you think that if for some reason you eat your sandwich with dirty hands that God's going to be upset with you? And by the way, can dirt that transfers from your hand to your mouth going down your esophageal uh, tracked into your stomach does dirt defile you spiritually the answer is no but these people believed that unless they washed the cup and washed the pitcher and watch wash the couches in, in other words that they were ritually defiled and they had to be ritually cleansed do you remember how jesus answers these religious leaders he quotes isaiah and he calls them all hypocrites and he says they honor god with their lips but their heart is far from them that they laid aside the commandment of god that they embraced the traditions of men that the washings of pitchers and cups and other things that you do the idea being that the ritual dis cleansed described in the law extended to these inanimate objects then Jesus goes on and, and says you've made up all of these crazy religious things 
and you wind up dishonoring and disobeying what God has clearly said for you to do. And the laying on of the hands. The laying on of the hands is a reference to the priest laying hands on the animal sacrifice. And so the priest would lay hands on the sacrifice to identify with the sacrifice and then offer that sacrifice. In the religious culture and in the Hebrew tra tradition, the animal was taking the sinner's place on the altar of sacrifice. They would, the priest would lay his hand on the animal, the idea being that that animal is taking your place, and then they would kill the animal. And this prefigures the reality that Jesus is our sacrifice. And I suspect that what this writer is talking about is the Day of Atonement. That there were Hebrews, there were Hebrew people who were going back to the temple who continued to participate in the sacrifices when in fact Jesus had already been the satisfying solution to every sin that they had ever committed. And then he talks about the fact clearly about the resurrection of the dead. Some Jews denied a literal resurrection. Remember the Sadducees didn't believe in a literal resurrection. And you'll remember the Old Testament revelation says that there is a resurrection. And Jesus told the religious leaders, remember he said to them, you're struggling over this issue of the resurrection, but the Old Testament repeatedly says God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Is God a God of the living or is God a God of the dead? And the right answer, of course, is Abraham is alive and Isaac is alive and Jacob is alive. They're alive somewhere. But the Bible pictures a time when everyone who has a right relationship with God comes back to life. Jesus told the religious leaders and he told his own disciples that he is the resurrection and the life. And clearly every Bible believing Jew embraced the notion not only of the fact that there would be a future resurrection, but that judgment would follow that re resurrection. And so you'll remember in John chapter 11 when Lazarus dies and Jesus says to Mary and Martha... Your, your, your brother's going to come back to life. And they said, yes, yes, Rabbi, we know, we know in the resurrection. It was common belief that the dead would come back to life and that following this resurrection that there would be eternal judgment. And the Old Testament re repeatedly affirms that God will execute judgment from sin. And in verse 3 it says, and this we will do if God permits. The whole point being, look, we've already covered this territory. We've already laid this foundation. Why in the world would you keep going backwards instead of forwards? Because going backwards means forsaking the substance, which is Christ, for the symbol and the shadow. What person in their right mind would want the symbol and the shadow when you can have the substance? And so I think what the author is in effect saying is give up the temple sacrifices, give up the rituals, give up the priests. Jesus is your sacrifice. Jesus is the fulfillment of the ritual. Jesus is your priest. And the writer's ready to go forward. He's ready to go forward. He's ready to move on to something higher and bigger and brighter. But their immaturity won't let them. But I'm also going to suggest to you that their immaturity is not only disgraceful, but it's dangerous. And that the writer is in effect saying, I need you to make up your minds to go forward. I need you to make up your minds to go forward. I need you to make up your minds to go forward in grace, go forward in grace. And again, I'm not suggesting a New Year's resolution where you go, well, what, what does this mean? What, what, 
what does this mean for me? Maybe most of you or some of you or I don't know exactly every single person's religious upbringing or, or religious background, but I grew up in a religious tradition that when I had a right relationship with God and Christ, I returned to this religious tr tradition. I returned to it because it was the religious tradition that I grew up in. And the religious tradition that I grew up in meant that you went to mass and you went to confession and, and you lit candles and you made a good confession and you did all of those things. In, in other words, I grew up in a world where... For me, God was, that, that I believed that God saved people through Jesus, but there was something more. It was more than just simply believing in Jesus. I had to believe that I had to go to a particular church and I had to attend that church and I had to follow its rules and I had to make this confession and that if I had a mortal sin, it would kill me forever. And then I had to make a good confession and, and then I would go on this roller coaster ride. But it was all that I knew. Until I started reading the Bible and I started thinking about grace and I kept reading what the Bible kept repeatedly saying over and over again that I'm saved by grace through faith and that, that it's not of works and, and, and that it's the gift of God lest any person should boast. And I started reading the Bible and I knew that you could have a right relationship with God and that it was Jesus that saves you and it wasn't going to church and it wasn't rit rituals and it wasn't religion and it wasn't any of those things. And so finally, the priest said to me, well, you know, it's so good to see you bringing all your friends to church and it's great. You know, what do we need to do to bring more young people to the church? And I said, we need to ditch this catechism and we need to tell people that they can have a right relationship with God and Christ, that Jesus loves them and that he's willing to save them. And he accused me of Jesus, being a Jesus freak and he asked me to leave the church. <laughs> you know, it sounds funny. But at the time it wasn't funny to me. I was hurt. I was wounded. Because that was the religious tradition that, that I grew up in. And I, and I didn't know that you could just simply walk away from your religious tradition and that, that people would just leave you high and dry because my grandma and my grandpa were in that religious tradition and their grandma and grandpa and their grandma's grandma and grandpa and back for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And I grew up in a culture and a society where part of your identity was your religious tradition. And so he's, at, he's going to address this issue, uh, grasping at what's at stake. Look at verse 4. For it is impossible, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good work of God and the power of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. When I started doing research for this particular passage of scripture, guess how many interpretations I found? Not one, not five, not even 16, 26 different interpretations. There are literally 26 different interpretations. I'm going to give you four. I'm boiling it down to these four which seem the most plausible. And then I'm going to tell you what I think it means. The first interpretation is that the writer is describing what's called the sin of apostasy. The sin of apostasy is where Christians turn from their faith. They abandon Christ. They abandon his love and his grace and his mercy. They basically say, there's no God, there's no Christ, there's no salvation, there's no gospel. I went to church. It's one big, fat, stinking joke. None of it is real. God isn't real. The Bible isn't real. Jesus isn't real. Salvation isn't real. And they walk away. 
The second is that the writer is describing the make-believer. Let's go back to the first one just for a moment. If the writer is describing the sin of apostasy, then he's describing a group of Hebrew Christians who embrace Christ, embrace the gospel, but who abandon Christ and abandon the gospel and they go back to Judaism. And and if that's true, then what the writer is in effect saying is that there's no second option. It isn't, well, I used to be a Jew and now I can get saved because I'm a Jew because I'm going to follow the ordinances and the law of Moses. I'm going to perform the rites, the rituals. I'm going to embrace the sacrifices and I'm going to go back to all of that because it's just too hard. It's just too hard being a Christian. It's just too hard and I can't do it anymore. The second option is that the writer is describing the make-believer. The person who's exposed to Christ in Christianity. He's exposed or she's exposed to Christ in Christianity and faith. And they're exposed to the Bible and they're exposed to the teaching. But they're never truly born again. They make a pretense of faith. Then they abandon a faith that they never truly embraced. The third option is that the writer is presenting a hypothetical case because he says if they fall away, even though such a thing probably can't happen, it's a hypothetical case where people, if they could lose their salvation, but then he argues that if in fact that were possible, you can't get it back. If he's describing a person who is saved and then subsequently loses their salvation, then you can't get it back. Or number four, the writer is describing a sin, possibly only that the Jews living in that particular time period between the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and then the subsequent destruction of the temple, who could go to the temple, who could it be involved in all of these temple sacrifices, but that such a person couldn't even possibly exist at this particular time. So which is it? Are these believers who lose their salvation, are these make-believers who were never saved to begin with? And by the way, They're either one or the other. Remember, I've told you over and over again, there's two kinds of people in the world, Italian people and people who wish they were. But that's that's not true in this particular case. It's not about being Italian or not being Italian. Here, the issue is you are saved or you're not saved. Because whether he's talking about saved people or unsaved people will probably for the most part determine not only your interpretation of the passage but then the 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 conclusion that you draw j vernon mcgee used to say i believe in the assurance of the believer and i believe in the non-assurance of the make believer i like that but what if i suggested to you that none of these explanations probably are fair to the text. That none of these explanations completely satisfy what I think that the author is saying and the point that he's trying to make. What if I told you that I think that the whole passage has not anything to do with the question, can a Christian lose their salvation? That's not the point of this passage. The key to understand, and we can talk about that, and I'm happy to talk about that. But first I want to talk about the text itself and try and help you understand what it is that you're reading. The key to understanding the passage is to read it in its context and then understand the writer's plain statement. The issue isn't salvation, but rather repentance. Repentance. 
for it is impossible. Look what it says in verse 4. For it is impossible to renew them to repentance. It's not talking about salvation. The issue isn't salvation. The issue is repentance. And if the passage is teaching that a Christian can lose their salvation, then it's also teaching that they can't get it back. The overwhelming evidence in the New Testament, by the way, is that you're saved by grace, through faith, and that not of yourselves. Not only are you saved by grace, but you're kept by grace. I'm also going to suggest to you that in 1 John chapter 5, when John speaks of this issue in a separate kind of way of speaking about it, he says in chapter 5, verse 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. If the testimony is that God has given us eternal life, does eternal life sound like probationary life? Eternal and probationary aren't the same. If you've ever had a job and they said, you're on probation, that doesn't mean you have the job. It's, it could be temporary. They could let you go for any reason or no reason at all. Eternal by its very nature means eternal. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So John the Apostle says, no, when God saves you, he gives you eternal life, not temporary life, not probationary life, and this life is in his Son. In other words, whatever it means to have a right relationship with God means you that you have a right relationship with Christ. It means that Jesus loves you, that he's come inside of you, that he lives inside of you. And so, if he's talking about something different, and I think that he is, look at verse 4 again. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, those who have come a significant way in real faith, but have they come far enough? Do they know Christ? Are these people who actually know Jesus and who are attempting to return to Judaism or are these people who don't know Jesus and are attempting to return to Judaism? I think that the word means where it says once enlightened. I think that the word means that their eyes have been opened and the way that it's constructed, it means opened once and for all to what God offers in Christ. The idea being their eyes have been opened once and for all. In other words, this isn't an issue of misunderstanding the gospel. Maybe you grew up in a world where you heard the gospel over and over again. Oh, don't you know that God loves you? Oh, don't you know that Jesus loves you? Oh, don't you know that he died on the cross for your sins? Oh, don't you know that he, he rose from the dead? And you go, yeah, yeah, I, I know that. I heard that. I, I've heard that. I, I know that and I've heard that. I, I know that. I've heard that and I, I know it and I've heard it over and over and over and over again. But but knowing the gospel and hearing it and even knowing it and hearing it over and over and over again, does that mean that you have actually been born again? Is being born again something different from just hearing the gospel? Or, or does it mean actually receiving and believing and then you experience this transformation of heart on the inside? Have they seen the truth? The Hebrews see the truth enlightened savor the truth they they taste of the heavenly gift they see the truth they taste the truth what does this possibly mean they've tasted the character of christ the, 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 let, let me try and put it in in terms of new year's day, eve every new year's eve my wife makes a gigantic pot of new year's eve pozole 
Some of you from New Mexico may know what pozole is, but there's hominy, and then there's pork, and then there's cilantro and cebolla, which is that green stuff and the wonderful onion. It's a, it's a Mexican dish. And, and so what you do is you stew that baby and you, you cook it in the pot and you stew it all day long with red chili. And then you take a, a lemon and you squeeze it over the top of it. Now imagine you take a spoon and you stick it in the pot of pozole that my wife has made and you stick it in your mouth and you taste it and you go, ay corazoncita, that is delicious, that is wonderful. There's a difference between having a taste of the pozole and there's a difference between putting a great big bowl of pozole in front of you and then eating that pozole. Is it possible that there are people who have tasted, but they've never actually sat down with the bowl? They've tasted, they go to church, they see people's lives, they see what it means to know God, to love God, to experience um, of salvation and, and mercy and forgiveness, the gift of the scriptures, the gift of Christ, the gift of his spirit. Can you imagine? You taste the gift. You taste the scripture. There's a taste of Christ. There's a taste of the spirit. You partake of the Holy Spirit at the end of verse 4. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come and make Jesus real to the soul. That's what it says in John chapter 16, where it says that the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, to convict us of righteousness, to convict us of the judgment to come. They have not just tasted the spiritual character, but they also, they've experienced the spiritual content. They tasted the good word of God in verse 5. John Philip says, the types of the tabernacle, the preaching of the prophets, the song of the psalmist, All of these fulfilled in Christ. New Testament truth does not contradict Old Testament truth, but completes it. All the tributaries, all of the streams of the Old Testament pouring their united floods into the ocean of Christ. They have been seen by the Jews. They've tasted the good word of God. The idea being that the Jewish person who's read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they know about the Messianic prophet. Uh, prophecies. They've tasted the powers of the world to come. They've seen the miracles. They've seen the supernatural workings wrought by Christ and the apostles. They've seen the evidence of the transformation of thousands of lives. They've seen Peter. They've seen Paul. They've seen John. They've seen these people completely changed. Imagine you've experienced all of those things. And you say, I don't want that. That's not what I want. And look what it says in verse 6. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. I think in order to understand our passage The whole thing lies in verse 6. There are two key words in verse 6. Read it again. If they fall away. So the first thing that we have to look at is fall away. To renew them again to repentance. Since they crucify again for themselves the son of God. And put them to an open shame. The second one is crucify. The first word fall away translates a Greek word, and it's not the Greek word I was expecting. The Greek word I was expecting is aposteo, which we get the word apostasy. It means to fall away from belief. It means to fall away from trust. But that's not the word that's used here. It's parapipto. You may not know what that that word means, but let me help you. It means to fall by the wayside. It means to fall beside. It means to turn away. It means to wander away. It's very much like the word trespass. Again, Warren Wiersbe says, quote, so verse 6 describes believers who have experienced the spiritual blessings of God, but who fall by the side 
or trespass because of unbelief. Having done this, they're in danger of divine chastening. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 13. And if you flip over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son and daughter. The idea being that these aren't make believers who are pretending to be believers. These are real believers who've fallen by the wayside. The, he goes on and he says, having done this, they're in danger of chastening, Hebrews 12, or becoming castaways, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, which results in a loss of reward and divine disapproval, but not the loss of salvation. The phrase seeing they crucify, verse 6, should be translated while they are crucifying. In other words, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, doesn't teach that sinning saints cannot be brought to repentance, but that they cannot be brought to repentance while they continue to sin and put Christ to shame. Believers who continue in sin prove that they haven't repented. Samson and Saul are cases in point. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, cites the case of Esau as well, unquote. So Paul doesn't worry about people losing their salvation. Paul worries about something else. He worries about losing reward. He worries about losing something else, but it's not his salvation. In 1 Corinthians 9, it says, Know ye not that, that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize, so run that you can obtain. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one who beats the air, but I keep under my body, bring it to subjection, lest by any means which I preach to others, I should be a castaway. The word castaway means rejected. It means disqualified. It means disqualified to receive a reward. Paul isn't thinking of salvation. He's thinking about receiving a crown. He's using the metaphor of a race to describe the Christian life. Sinners can't run in that race. Only Christians can walk in the Christian walk. Christians get to participate in the Christian walk. But is it possible that a person can go to church, say Christian things, pray Christian prayers, read a Bible, say things that sound like a Christian, but they're really not a Christian. They've never been changed. They've never been born again. The whole point is that the passage isn't a theological examination of whether or not the believer can lose their salvation. Hebrews 6 speaks of Christians who begin a race and then they stumble and then they fall and some of them fall by the wayside. This leads me to believe that Paul really, is, as he's talking about it, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and also in Philippians chapter 3, he speaks of this reoccurring image of a lot of people start this race called the Christian life. But some of them drop out. And I think that that's the point of the passage. That the Hebrew Christians were thinking about dropping out. They were thinking about dropping out because the pain and the isolation and the persecution and the resultant disfavor and displeasure of family and friends were driving them back to an old world and an old lifestyle. 
I think that what happens when the Christian refuses to act like a Christian or walk like a Christian or walk in obedience, that later we're going to discover that they become subject to discipline. And the reality is that each and every one of us will stand before God and give an account of our life at the judgment seat of Christ. So the subject is really spiritual immaturity and repentance. The believer's attitude about their own growth and direction. But only you know the truth about yourself. Paul said, examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the family. Are you a child of God? You see, the truth is, if you are a child of God, then you have a responsibility to grow. And if you're not a child of God, the worst thing, the most horrible thing that you could possibly do is try to live a Christian life when you're not a Christian. When you don't have the resources of the Holy Spirit. When you don't have the presence of God in your life. That's why Paul says, examine yourself. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened, disciplined of the Lord. That we should not be condemned with the world. And so what is the point? If you're a Christian, grow up. If you're not a Christian, get saved. Well, what if I don't want to make up my mind? Then you're on thin ice. You need to plant your foot firmly on one side or the other. Greg Laurie used to call that person a mugwump. He called him a mugwump because their mug was on one side of the fence and their wump was on the other. <laughs> and they were completely miserable in both worlds. Is it hard being a Christian? Sometimes. Is it scary being an unbeliever? I think so. I can remember being an unbeliever. I can remember going to bed at night going, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to sleep. Oh, I'm going to die. Oh, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to face judgment. I'm not ready to face Christ. I'm, there's, there's too many things that are just wrong. And at some point I had to come to that place in my own life where I go, I need to know Jesus. I need to know him. I need to walk with him. I need to know him and be known by him. But you don't just get to wake up one day and go, oh, today's the day I'm going to be a Christian. The Bible says no one comes to the Father unless they're drawn by the Holy Spirit. But the Bible also says today is the day of salvation. And if you've heard the gospel message, if you made a profession or a confession of faith, the Bible's invitation isn't to a dead religious system in order to have what appears to be a right relationship with God. It's a call to transformation because God saves you in Christ. For the Christian, you're called to run a race and go to a specific place towards a finish line. And what is that finish line? It's to be molded and shaped into the image of Jesus. That's the finish line. Christians, run. Unbelievers, run for your life. But there's a place for you. You can run into the arms of Jesus. Spiritual immaturity doesn't have to stay that way. You can go forward in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we can see that we're called to grow up. We're called to run that race. 
Lord, we know that in Philippians, it says, brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to the things which are before, I press forward to the mark, to the mark, to the finish line, to the finish line, to the goal for the prize, the crown, the laurel wreath of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I run to lay hold of that for which God laid hold of me. Lord, why did you save Paul? To make him like Jesus. Lord, why did you save me? To make me like, to make me like Jesus. Lord, why did you save the people who are hearing my voice? It's to make them like Jesus. To grow up. And go forward. And cross the finish line. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.